that don't know, I mean, him and him and uh, Mark were way closer than me and him. And, uh, you know, so he's down for Justin and the family and just trying to be an encouragement to them. So while he was down here, we kind of took advantage of that whole deal. And um, so he's going back uh, tomorrow, but we wanted him to come and, and preach tonight and just, you know, uh, this is a real weird time for us as we sit on Sunday morning. Hey, uh, man, we, we, you know, I feel in like some of you. I mean, I feel like, I feel like Moses crossed over, man. And, uh, so, you know, we, we, uh, we're, st I'm still in a little state of shock. And so I'm still dealing with some of that. I, we was talking today and, um, you know, it's weird because I, I have already a couple of times tried to text him, like just forgetting that um, he's he's not able to text me back. So, you know, let's just uh, let's call the Lord tonight. Um, obviously, I think uh, Miss Amber, did I see Amber and Jerry here? Okay. Uh, she was telling me the other day that she was having some real serious problems. Um, so I don't know the extent of them, but let's pray for her tonight um, as well. We've got a, a mom that has a little boy on our ball team. And um, he is, uh, he's gone through a lot of tests at, M, uh, at, uh, at Choa, and he's got light, if I remember right, light matter on his brain. Is that right, Jordan? That's what the text said. What, what, did, what did you hear? Yeah, it's kind of the same thing. Right? What? She said today that it wasn't supposed to, I don't know, maybe she don't know what the heck she's talking about, but, um, oh, sorry, um, see, happy that way, um, anyway, the, they're worried about the kid's life expectancy, and that he will never talk, and so, they, she, I think she already has one child with special needs now. And uh, so, just just if you if you can, maybe write that down and, and let's pray for them. Um, and we're we're going to try to minister to that family somehow or another. And um, here at the church, so uh, we'll try to be a blessing to them, and obviously try to reach that family uh, with the gospel eventually. Uh, but let's just start praying for them and, and asking God to open the door there. All right. Um, let's pray, and uh, then we'll uh, we'll get after it. All right, Father, we we love you. Thank you, Lord, for tonight. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you for my friend being here tonight, and and God, uh, you using him to encourage me uh, along these these last two days. And Lord, ha them having a heart for for Justin, and them having a heart to come down and, and try to encourage him during this time. And and Lord, spend you know, their own money to be down here, to be a blessing and and, and to love on them and, and try to encourage the family. And uh, God, I pray that you bless this coming weekend. God, that, uh, Lord, everything said and done would, would honor the Lord through us honoring Brother Mark. And I pray that you would uh, that you'd take that ministry that he has invested in us and God, that, that it would multiply across the nation's across this county, Lord, that, that we could see fruit for our labor, uh, Lord, because of the investment that, that Brother Mark made in many of us. And uh, I pray that you give us a good night here tonight, Lord. I pray that you use uh, Brett, Lord, these uh, prayer requests that were mentioned tonight. Lord, I pray that you would, uh, Lord, that you touch that little boy, God, in the situation that he's got going on. Uh, Lord, with the stuff that Miss Amber's got going, Lord, obviously, Ryder, I pray that you keep using that whole deal. And, and Lord, as the good news comes, I, I thank you for that. I pray that you would help us and uh, honor, that we honor you in all that we do, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, here's your Bible.
Am I on? Yes. Am I on? Okay. All right. Well, how's everybody doing? Good. Uh, it's good to be here again. Uh, I, I, from most of you probably don't remember uh, that I have actually preached here before. Um, I believe that I was falsely accused of swearing from the pulpit when I was here before. I'd like to clear my name on that. Um, what, there are swear words down here that are not considered swear words up, in, up north. I'm a northerner by default. I actually was not swearing. Is everybody cool with that? All right, we can move on. All right. Now, having said that, um, I am a northerner, and, uh, and I have a lot of fun being a northerner when I'm down south. Um, Y'all think I talk weird. Okay, I know. I've already, I've, already been, I've already been made fun of by the pastor's wife for saying, for saying pop. And then and so she, she says, I say pop. I said, I, I actually say pop, and I'll say pop. But uh, this is a pop, okay? This is not, well, this actually is a Coke. But just so you know, not everything is Coke. We think that's really weird that you guys call every pop a Coke. And then you have to say, what kind of Coke? And then you say something that's not a Coke. We, just so you know, we think you're just as weird as you think that we're weird. So, so I didn't swear, and we're both equally weird. So everybody's clear. We're on an equal playing field. And we can talk about the Bible now. Can we move on, please? Can we actually get to the preaching? All right, we're going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 19. And uh, actually, we're going to read verses 5 through 12, and then I'll do some explaining. All right. <clears throat> and as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head, and he did eat and drink. And laid him down again, and the angel of the Lord came again the second time, and touched him, and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of the meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And he came thither unto a cave, and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life and take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mountain uh, before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, and breaking in pieces in the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice. So uh, actually, to give you just a little bit of background on this, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a review and say, well, a review of what? Uh, a review of a series that I've been preaching at my church, so it's not a review for you, but I'm still going to do it by way of introduction anyway because I think it's important uh, because we've actually been dealing with something in our church for a while, and it's been kind of a strange deal, um, and it's actually been kind of a spiritual battle in our church, a very unique spiritual battle that I haven't experienced in the entire time I've been a, a senior pastor. We've been dealing with something that the world calls depression. And uh, because the world calls it depression and because there's other forms of depression and, and, and all of those forms of depression and those terms and those dynamics and those definitions actually all transpire under the guise of what is called psychology. And because psychology is merely a pseudoscience of a branch of what we would might call human wisdom, uh, the truth of the matter is, is that it's not profitable for us. I'm not saying that there's not a place for psychology. I'm not saying that there is. I'm not saying that there's not a place for uh, psychotropic medication. I'm not saying that there isn't, and I'm not saying that there is. What I'm saying is this. Whatever you think of Christian psychology, whatever you think of psychotropic medicine, whatever you think of depression, uh, whatever you think of these constructs of man to categorize man into certain, into certain categories and pigeonhole them for the purposes of giving them prescription, Whatever you think of that, if you're a Bible believer, you shouldn't look at any of that as the solution to a problem. Everything that we need in this life for spiritual life and godliness is in the Word of God. Everything that we need. And if you don't accept, the, if you don't accept that about the Word of God, then, then you, you actually have abdicated your right to even refer to yourself as a Bible believer. But there's another issue, and this is what we're finding at Wildwood Baptist Church. And that is churches like Wildwood Baptist Church and churches like this church and other quote-unquote Bible-believing churches, although they may intellectually believe in, in, in the absolute authority of Scripture, 
The problem is, is that Satan has used human wisdom and human psychology and has used uh, education and has used this world system and has used media and has used the news and has used relationships and has used pornography and has used the internet and has used, has used uh, uh, smartphones and has used secular music and has used... Sec and, and okay, well, do, do I have a smartphone? Yes. Do I listen to secular music? Yeah, I, I actually do. Well, what kind of secular music? Not the kind of stuff where people are biting off bad heads or anything, but it's not all like, you know, it's not all God honoring, I'm sure. I mean, a, a little Billy Joel here and there never hurt anybody, as far as I'm concerned. But uh, uh, pro probably not the best selection. Probably better things I could be listening to. I'm not saying that I'm better than you. I'm not saying that I don't do these things. I'm saying that I am a Laodicean, just like every one of you. And as a Laodicean, I am subject to the stimulus that is Laodicean stimulus. It's just that simple. We are Laodiceans. And I think that the best that most of us are going to do is to be the best Laodiceans that we can be, for most of us. Very few of us are going to break out of that. And, 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 and I'm here to tell you guys that Satan has a plan for Laodicean Bible believers that believe intellectually that the Bible is absolutely the Word of God and is absolutely authoritative. And so although they would never back up, they might even die. They might even die for the proposition of the authority of Scripture Though they believe that, they are completely removed from the proposition of the sufficiency of Scripture. Because the Word of God, as authoritative as they may think it is, does not serve as a conduit to a relationship with the person of Jesus Christ that causes them to not sin, that causes them to be able to reject a habitual sin and a lifestyle of sin and spiritual laziness. At the end of the day, there's only one reason that people don't shake themselves out of their Laodicea and the malaise, if you will, and that is because they just don't love Jesus enough to do it. Do you know why men look at pornography? Because they don't love Jesus Christ. Do you, do you, do you, know, do you, know, do you know why people don't ever witness? You know, why, you, you know why that's the case? Because they don't love Jesus Christ. And do you know why men don't submit to the authority of a local New Testament church? It's because they don't love Jesus Christ enough to do it. Do you know why women won't submit to their husbands? Because they don't love Jesus Christ. Well, you don't know what he did to me. You don't know what you did to Jesus Christ. And if you understood what you did to Jesus Christ, you wouldn't say something so stupid as, you don't know what he did to me. Because you don't matter. Jesus Christ matters. And a Laodicean doesn't understand that. And because a Laodicean doesn't understand that, they will not stop being Laodiceans. And that's just the truth of the matter. And the reason for that is, is we have found a way to cope outside of the idea of what we believe. So we believe that the Bible is the absolute and sufficient reason. We believe that, that, that there's nothing uh, that we need uh, other than the Word of God for life and godliness. But I have a problem, and so I'm going to go to food. I have a problem, so I'm going to go to a substance. I have a problem, so I'm going to go to psychology. I have a problem, so I'm going to go to sin. I have a problem, so I'm going to go to an ungodly relationship. And I cope practically with the world's systems, though intellectually I hang on to this idea that is trapped away in thoughts and ideas only, that the Word of God is all that I need and Jesus loves me, this I know. Well, okay, it's great that you know that Jesus loves you, but do you love Jesus Christ? And do you not only believe in the authority of Scripture, but do you also believe in the sufficiency of Scripture? Because my submission to you is this. If you don't believe in the sufficiency of Scripture, then nobody gives a rat's tail about your belief in the authority of Scripture. It makes no stinking difference. So, we, we all tracking with this northerner on that? Are you with me so far? Okay. I, don't, I didn't ask if I'm likable. I'm asking you if you agree with me. Because if you agree with me, then we actually have something to, to say. We can actually make some progress tonight. And, and, and then you can ha ha tell Lee not to have me back later, and that's fine. So, my point is this. You need to believe something that Elijah needed to believe when he was locked away in a cave running from a woman. You need to believe that if he'll take you to it, he'll take you through it. And that's something that Laodiceans have, have quit believing. That, 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 that God will take me to it, but that's not enough to take me through it, and so now I've got to go and cope. And I've got to go outside of my theological construct and, 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 my, and my biblical worldview 
of the, of the sufficiency of Scripture. I will intellectually believe in the authority of Scripture, but I'm going to have to find something else to add to it in order for it to be sufficient. And what that leads to is what the world calls depression. Now, I don't have time to develop it tonight, and I actually forgot what time I started. What time did I start, by the way? Uh, well, it, huh? Okay, well, I, I won't go that far. Um, the biblical word for depression, by the way, because if you don't ascribe a biblical word to it, then you can't analyze it biblically. You, you let the world redefine a term and then mix it up, and then you can't analyze what the Bible says about it. We've got to say, if, if, if depression is real, and I actually believe that it is, if depression is real, then you've got to ask yourself, what's the Bible word for it? So now you can look at it biblically instead of through the lens of human wisdom. The world by wisdom, by the way, knew not God. Don't forget that. Okay, so then what's the word for it? Well, I submit to you that the biblical word for it is Paul's word, faint. And if you want to check out fainting sometime, you can do a study about fainting in, in 1 and 2 Corinthians because Paul talks about fainting. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, this is what Paul says about depression. He says he doesn't want you to faint. And he gives the reason that people faint. People faint, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 15. Don't worry about the references. You can look it up later. Take notes. The reason that people faint is because they're not thankful. That's the real reason. You want to know what your problem with depression is? So, well, I struggle with depression. Okay, then here's what you struggle with. You struggle with not being thankful. And here's what you're not thankful for. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, you're not thankful for the gospel. And according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 14, you're not thankful for the resurrection. And if you would focus on what God has done for you, and you would focus on everything that you've been saved from, and you would focus on everything that you've been saved to, and you would focus on the fact that you're going to be resurrected, and that when you're resurrected, you're going to receive a new body, and you're going to live in a new body for eternity in the very presence of Jesus Christ, removed from the purview of sin, and everyone that you've ever known, and everyone that you've ever loved that was in Christ, you're going to see, and you're going to love, and you're going to know, even as they are known, and that that's going to be your entire existence for eternity, and that your time down here is only this long. So if your time down here stinks, who even gives an actual care anyway? Thank you. You don't know what that took. I'm very proud of myself. I didn't cuss. I've never cussed at this church. I'm sticking by it. I'm, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. I've never sworn at this church. Who cares? Who cares? Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. Well, you know, I did, I'm just I'm bummed out because Mark Trotter was a righteous guy, and he and and he and and and, and he died when he was 64. Well, Jesus Christ was a righteous guy, and he died when he was 33. Is the servant better than the master? Well, you don't know what Mark Trotter did for my life. I know what Mark Trotter did. I can, Mark Trotter did the same thing for my life. Praise the Lord. But, but, but why? why? Well, well Mark, Mark, Mark Trotter was the greatest Bible teacher that, 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 that I, I've ever heard in my life. Maybe that's true, but why? It's because the actual greatest Bible teacher of all time was living inside of him, and he also lives inside of you. The greatest Bible teacher that ever lived is the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters. That was the Spirit of God that was on Mark Trotter. That was the power of the Word of God that gave him his authority and that gave him his ability. No man has anything that wasn't given to him by God. So, so Mark Trotter's dead. Is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ leave? Is God gone? What are you depressed about? Come on, man. What are you depressed about? You see, we're not thankful. We're not thankful for what God has done. We're not thankful. Listen, you, 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 well, my, my kid has COVID. Listen, I was, at a, I was at a children's burn center three weeks ago. Your child up in a burn center right now? My kid, my, my kid two, two and a half years ago, lost like 34% like of his lungs. He had all parts of his body cut off. And they, they told me he had three days to live at one point when, when he had a failed second bone marrow transplant. Your kid in that situation? Listen, let me tell you something. You'd be so depressed about your relationship. You're so depressed about your job. Let me tell you something. You were on your way to hell. 
and there was no hope and no covenant and there was no light and there was no chance and you had nothing going for you and you were on your way to the lake of fire in eternity and now you're going to be at the right hand of the Father and you're going to be experiencing pleasures at His right hand forevermore with joy unspeakable and full of glory for eternity. What are you, what are you, listen, I can see, it's, I can see an unsafe person being depressed. What are you depressed about? What are you even talking about? You're depressed? Do you know what God has done for you? Do you know where you were going and where you're going now? You're depressed? Come on, man. You're not thankful. If you were thankful, you wouldn't be depressed. You know what Paul says? Paul says if you're not thankful, you're going to faint. That's Paul's word for depression. Because Satan is trying to make an impression on you. And 2 Corinthians chapter 4 describes that. And the impression that he's trying to make on you is that you are troubled and that you are perplexed and that you are persecuted and that you are cast down. Do you know why he's doing that? He tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Right? Because he wants you to be distressed and in despair and forsaken and destroyed. Satan's going to make an Im- he's going to make an impression on you. And it's up to you if that impression becomes a depression. Because Paul says, though we are troubled, we are not distressed. And though we are perplexed, we are not in despair. And though we are persecuted, we are not forsaken. And though we are cast down, we are not destroyed. Why? Because we have the ability to respond to the attacks of Satan to get us depressed with faith and thankfulness and joy in our hearts over the fact that he, was, that, that, he, that he lived and that he died and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and by conquering death for himself, he's able to conquer death for us by the simple message of grace through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now listen, if you're depressed, having received an inheritance with the saints in glory and are joint heirs with Jesus Christ, and, and, and you know that someday even your mortal body will put on immortality and you will measure up, if Paul is to be believed, to the standard of the full measure and stature of Jesus Christ himself in your resurrected body. Now you're depressed? You just, you're still depressed? You depressed now? Listen, brothers, we walk by faith and not by sight. And Elijah stopped doing that. Elijah stopped worrying about his situation. And so God's going to give him some cures for depression. And that's what I want to do tonight. So if you're depressed, whatever you're depressed about, I've been depressed lately. I've been depressed that, 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 that there's spiritual warfare in our church. I've been depressed that I have tinnitus. I have, a, I have a condition of constant ringing in my ears. According to my ear doctors, it's one of the, and the hearing tests and the booths that I've been in and the tests that have been run on me, it's one of the loudest decibels of tinnitus that they've ever heard. It's not inner ear tinnitus. It's actually brain tinnitus. It will never go away. I've had anxiety attacks over it. I've, been t- I, 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 I've taken some medicine for my anxiety attacks. Say, well, you're weak. Why? Well, of course I'm weak. I'm from the north. You've got to be kidding me. We're all weak. What did the medicine do for you? Did it make Ringo go away? No, it just turned me into a zombie, so I couldn't respond to it no matter how depressed I was. Couldn't have an anxiety attack, so I couldn't even move. I couldn't get off the bed. Couldn't even get my dog to stop licking my face. I didn't have the energy to do that. Stuff turned me into a flat zombie. Got me through a tough time, but it wasn't the solution. You know what the solution was? The solution was my focusing on a day where I'll never have ringing in my ears again. I'll never have to worry about anything again. You get your eyes off the future. You get your eyes off of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, you're going to get depressed because that's Satan's plan for you. So let me give you some cures for depression. You ready? All right, cure number one. You've got to ask yourself what God asked Elijah. How did you get here? How did you, a child of God, get here? Look at it in verse 9. And they came thither to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? Listen, guys, what are we even doing? What are you even doing here? How did you even get to the place that you have no spiritual energy? How did you get to the place that you don't do devotions anymore? 
How do you get to the place that you don't do devotions with your wife and with your kids? How do you get there? How do you lack the energy to do those things? You know what that is? When it comes to spiritual things, you faint. Now, you'll work 80 hours a week physically, but when it comes to spiritual things, you'll faint. How? How how does a child of God, given everything that he's been given, and been given the image of God, and the responsibility of evangelism, and the responsibility of discipleship, and the responsibility to be the husband of his wife, and the responsibility to raise his children in the nurture and admonition of a godly home, and the responsibility to live in holiness, and the responsibility to live his life now, viewing his life now the way that he will view it when he looks back at it at the judgment seat of Christ. How can you be given everything that you've been given, know everything that you know, do everything that you have done, know everything that God has done for you, and then freaking quit? How do you do that? How'd you even get there? How'd you get in that position? A child of God sitting around moping about some some idiot that hurt their feelings. So now they're going to have to sit and make, have God take it on the chin because of some idiot Christian hurt their feelings 10 years ago and they've been pouting for 10 years not doing anything for God. Is that God's fault? How'd you even get here, bro? How many days in a row did you have to ignore the word of God and walk and grieve the Holy Spirit with your lifestyle to get to the place that you've gotten? Child of God has no business being depressed. He's got no excuse for it. And you need to ask yourself that question. You need to ask yourself how you got here. All right, question number two. Now, you ready for this one? Because you're not going to like this one. So I didn't like the first one. I didn't like the introduction. I don't like you. I don't like your forehead. I don't like the way you spit. I don't like the, I don't like the fact you said freaking. We consider that cussing. You just broke your rule. Listen, I get it. But you don't have, you don't have to like me. I, I just want to know if you agree with me. I want to know if you agree that a child of God that has been redeemed and saved from hell and given the image of Jesus Christ in a hope of an unclouded day, an eternal day in glory with Jesus Christ, has anything to complain about. I want to know if you agree with that. Because if you agree with it, well, then stop complaining. If you agree with it, then just get over it. Because you know what? It gets worse than this. It gets worse than this. Worse things have happened to better people. Stop sucking your thumb. All right? Number two. You ready? You ready for the fun? All <laughs> right? Ain't no party like a northern preacher party because a northern preacher party don't stop. Yeah, here we go. All right. Verse 10. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. I, even I, only am left. Now, Satan says I five times. Christians only say it twice. So, you know, they're not that bad. But I, even I, only am left. And by the way, I want you to look at his complaint. But you want to know how I got here? Here's how I got here. By the way, everything he says is true. Everything he says is true. Look at it. Had the children of Israel, had they forsaken God's covenant? Yes. Okay, so God's people are hypocrites. How'd you get here, Elijah? Well, God's people are hypocrites. Did God say that that wasn't true? Yeah, God's people are hypocrites. What, is it, what does that have to do with your responsibilities to God? What does it have to do with your responsibility? Of course God's people are hypocrites. They're Laodiceans. They're horrible. They're awful. Listen, I'm jaded. I've been working with Christians for a long time. I only trust like six of them on the planet. So you don't trust the body of Christ? No. You've been hanging out with the body of Christ lately? Why would you trust them? I trust the world before I trust the church. you got to be kidding me. Oh, that's a horrible thing to say. Well, you haven't met the Christians I've met, apparently. See, it gets worse. Be thankful. Of course God's people are hypocrites. And of course it makes it worse that they're God's people. Okay, so here's the question. When did that become the point? What does that have to do with Elijah and God? 
Yeah, God's people are hypocrites. Okay, look at this next one. They've thrown down nine altars. All right, so they've compromised in church. Of course, they've compromised in church. They all, they all go to churches that, you know, with, that end with points spelled with an E, and their pastors have, you know, facelifts and frosted hair, and they wear skinny jeans, and they're ambiguously heterosexual, and they, they reference 19 different versions of the Bible. Yeah, I get it. It's compromised. It's horrible. It's terrible. And they've, sl- oh, they've slain the prophets with the sword. The world's coming to get me. God's people are hypocrites. The pastors are apostates, and the world's coming to kill me. Oh, I know. That, that, that's absolutely true. By the way, God's people are hypocrites in Christ's day. And God's people had broken the covenants in Christ's day. And the religious leaders had sold out in Christ's day. And the world came to kill Jesus Christ. And that didn't prevent him from dying for you. So I'm just trying to figure out why that's an excuse for you to not die for him. Because for the life of me, brothers and sisters, I can't figure it out. I don't know what all that has to do with your relationship with God. God let you down? Is God's fault? How'd you get here? And number two, are you willing to accept your negative circumstances? Are you willing to accept your negative circumstances? Well, yeah, I'm going to name it and claim it, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to speak my, I'm going to speak my reality into existence with my truth because I am going to be the embodiment of the I am. No, listen, the Apostle Paul asked Christ three times to remove the thorn in the flesh from him, brothers and sisters. And what did Jesus Christ tell him? No, my grace is sufficient for you. God doesn't want to change your negative circumstances. As a matter of fact, God caused the negative circumstances. He allowed the negative circumstances. Because he's more interested in those circumstances changing you than he is in changing your circumstances. And what he wants to know is, are you willing to accept your negative circumstances? Well, I don't know what to do. I messed up. Okay, fine, you messed up. You know, they've got these programs now for girls where they can, like, grow their virginity back or something. You know, these Christian girls go to these. Do you think I'm lying? Oh, you're second to virginity. There's no second virginity. You give your body over to some pizza face kid that's barely post pubes best, and you've got to live with that crap for the rest of your life. That's on you, girlfriend. God didn't make you do that. You sleep with some guy, you're going to have to live with that. You can't get your virginity back. I know that we live in an age where there's a lot of non-practicing virgins in the Baptist churches. I get it. But you can't, you can't get that back. It's precious. It's pure. You'll never get that back again. You better give that up to one man in your entire life, and that man better be your husband. Say, well, I feel bad that I did that. Well, I don't know what to tell you. You shouldn't have done it. You're stupid. Now go repent, and God will forgive you, and he'll move on from that, and and he'll use you, and he won't use you to the way that he could have used you, but he'll use you more than if you just sit in a pew for 20 years and cry about the fact that you screwed up and you can't psychologically get over it. You should have found forgiveness in the blood of Jesus Christ, and you should have moved on. See, I messed up in the past. Okay, you messed up in the past. What does that even mean? Move on! Quit sitting around here crying about it as if that's going to do something. That's not going to do anything. Well, I have a sinful past. We all have a sinful past. Well, I used to kick puppies. Stop kicking puppies. Ask God to forgive you for kicking puppies. Don't kick any more puppies. Don't be a puppy kicker. And go, go serve God. And say, well, I don't know how God's upset with me for kicking puppies. I don't either. We'll find out at the judgment seat of Christ. But do you think it's going to be better if you add not serving God for the rest of your life onto being a puppy kicker? What do you want from me? What do you want from your pastor? What do you want from God? Go to him, stop kicking puppies, get forgiven, and start serving the Lord. But is this this hard? I mean, is it, why is this math so hard for a Laodicean to follow? Listen, it is what it is. Well, I'm in debt. I'll never get out of debt. Well, then you're st- you shouldn't have lived off of a credit card and not worked the first three years of your marriage. 
I don't know what to tell you. That was a bad decision. Well, I'm paying 18%. I think I'm going to pay 18% for the rest of my life. Okay, well, fine. You pay 18% interest. Well, there are no debtor's prisons in this country. You just won't drive a cool car. Who cares? Nobody cares. Nobody freaking cares. So, well, do, sh shouldn't I get out of debt? Yeah, hopefully. Maybe your debt is so bad you'll never get out. So what? Be a debt-ridden evangelist who's serving God and doing the most he can do with his insurmountable debt. Like, I don't know what to tell you, but you better learn how to accept your negative circumstances and not wait for God to change them because God might not ever change them. You're presuming on the grace of God. You're making a deal with God. Give me what I want, and then I'll start serving you. He already did that when you got saved. Remember you asked him to get saved? He gave you what you wanted? Okay, now start serving him. But man, commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Maybe the, way, maybe the reason that we're struggling with depression, maybe the reason that we're struggling with these thoughts is because we're just not obeying God. You see, psychology says, get your thoughts right, and then you can start working right. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says just the opposite. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Maybe, just maybe, you have one problem, and that's you don't obey. Maybe that's how you got depressed. And maybe the way you got there is the way you're going to stay there. Amen? All right, so that's question number two. Now you guys ready for question number three? I don't think you are. I think Brian is. I think Brian's with me. Brian seems the only one to be excited right now. Jordan, you with me on this? Okay, all right. I don't care about Lee. I, you're in trouble with Jordan, you're in trouble. If you're in trouble with Lee, eh, whatever. All right, so here we go. You've got to acknowledge whose hand you're in. Look at it, verses 11 and 12. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice. All right, now listen, you've got to learn. You've got to learn to acknowledge whose hand you're in. Some of the most powerful forces on earth are mentioned right here. And when raging... And you're in the middle of one of these things, and by the way, I've lived through a tornado, and I'm not preaching, I'm telling the truth. I've lived through a tornado. And one of the weirdest things that ever happened to me in my life, sky turned green, and I don't mean kind of green, I mean emerald green. And it sounded like a freight train was passing two inches from my ear, and then it got deadly silent. And a lawn chair levitated straight up in the air, swirled around, and shot 75 yards sideways into a barn, and it smashed the smashed the chair to smithereens. True story. And then the earthquake, or the earthquake, the tornado, touched down on my property. I can't even tell you. It's pandemonium. But I'll tell you this. There ain't no acting like a man. I don't care how tough you think you are. I don't care what bar fight you survived. I don't care what football team you played for. I don't care if you wrestled. I don't care if you boxed. I don't care, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't care whatever manly story you have. You have a tornado touch down 120 yards from your house, and you are going to pee your pants. I mean, like, actually, like, I'm talking about, not metaphorically, I'm talking about, like, urine stains. Starting here and going all the way down to the socks, urine. That's what will happen. Because ain't nobody that tough. Nobody's that tough. You know what God does? He takes Elijah and he puts him in the middle of a tornado. You know what God does? He takes Elijah and he puts him in the middle of a fire. You know what God does? He takes Elijah and he puts him through an earthquake. And then once he goes through it, do you know what Elijah realizes? Now, now listen, pay attention to this. He hasn't been harmed. Because God can take you through an earthquake and God can take you through a fire and God can take you through a hurricane and see that you're not harmed. So now what exactly is it that you're facing that you're afraid that you're not going to make it through when you've got God with you? And he's running from a woman now. Guy has the ability to call down fire, takes on all the prophets of Baal, 
can shut up the clouds that it doesn't rain, and here he is. Run, well, why do you say running from a woman? Because I know this is hard for a layout of scene to understand. Because women can't take men. Because they're not equal. I know. Well, the new equalizer is a woman. Yeah, I've, I love it. You know, these women like. You really think that's real? You, you really? You want, you want to see the equality of men and women physically? As soon as we're done preaching, all the guys get on this side. All the girls get on this side. We'll meet in the middle. Okay, we'll try and beat each other's brains out. We'll see how long that lasts. How, what, what, who, who's your money on on that fight? You know who's going to win that fight? The guys. And they'll be laughing and giggling and doing it with their left hand. Because you can't take a guy. That's not realistic. You see, this is un, an unrealistic fear that a woman is coming after a man, and not just a man, but a man that can call down fire and not just call down fire, but be able to shut up the reins that can take on all the prophets of Baal, and yet now he's running from something that is so ridiculous, even from a human standpoint, and he has supernatural power over the obstacle. Listen, if God can take you to it, he'll take you through it. And you just have to believe that. What's he trying to teach him? He's trying to teach him this. Homeboy, it gets worse than Jezebel. It can be an earthquake. And I can keep you from being hurt. How did you get here? Why is it that you can't accept your negative circumstances? And why is it that you can't acknowledge the power of the hand that holds you and protects you in this life? Why can't you do that? I can put you through the most distress that you can possibly imagine and totally protect you from harm because I'm the one who controls the forces of nature. I tell them where to go. I tell them where to stop. I tell them for how long they can rage. And I tell them how much damage they can levy. And unless I allow it, it ain't happening. And I am telling you, I will never leave you or forsake you. And I am telling you, the greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And that's why, brothers and sisters, that's why Nahum says this. Nahum chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revenges and the furious. The Lord will take vengeance from his, on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. God can take you through a whirlwind and still protect you because God has his way and his will in the whirlwind. Listen, it gets worse than what you're going through, and God can handle it even if it gets worse. Do you believe that? I'm not asking you if you like it. I'm asking if you agree with it. You agree with that or not? Well, then what are we so stinking sad about? Come on now. You're more than a conqueror. Isn't that what we preach? God has caused you to be victorious and abound everywhere that you go. Isn't that what we preach? That's what we preach. Man, we stopped believing it. We stopped believing it, didn't we? Now, brothers and sisters, I'm, I'm actually here to help you. I'll close. This is going to help you. You know why God, you know why God asks him, how'd you get here? Because this is crazy spiritual advice. You ready? Because he wanted you to stop sinning. Well, you came, you, you came down here from Michigan, the, 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 the land of Gretchen Whitmer, the wicked witch of the north, to tell me to stop sinning? Yep, that's your problem. The greatest spirit, just stop. Well, I've got this issue, and I, can't, you know, I, 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 I don't understand. I just I can't stop you know, like, <laughs> snorting lines of, of cocaine. Well, okay, well, here's, here's, a, good, here's a good solution to that. So, so stop doing that. Like, stop rolling up dollar bills and, like, you know, getting in on a little mirror. Like, like you know, just don't do that. And then cocaine can't go up into your nose. 
And that's how you stop snorting cocaine. So if you've got a problem snorting cocaine, teens, I want you to know, that's how, here's how you stop. Just don't go around cocaine, and if you see cocaine, don't snort it up your nose. It won't get in your nose. Stop. 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 You guys got that? I got a little problem with sinning. Okay, I get it. Stop. God asks you how you get here because he wants you to stop sinning. It's that simple. Okay, so why does God, sorry, why does God want you to get, uh, get you to accept your negative circumstances? Uh, he, wants you to, he, he wants to get you to accept your negative circumstances because he wants you to be thankful for what you have. And he wants you to acknowledge the power of the hand that you're in Because he wants you to realize that it could get a lot worse than it is. And he wants you to realize that even if it got worse than it is, he would still have you and he would still hold you. Luke chapter 8, verses 22 through 25. Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples. And he said unto them, let us now go over on the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. But as they sailed, he, uh, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake. And they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And Uh, where am I? Jeopardy. Verse 24. And they came to him and, and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was calm. And they said unto them, And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and the water to obey him. So you're going through a storm in your life. Okay, great. Do you, do you, do you, know, do you know the one that has power over the winds? Do you know the one that has power over the storm? You know, we teach that story about Peter as if, like, okay, so, you know, Peter gets out of the boat, and then, you know, the storms are raging, and then Peter wants to walk on water like Jesus, and so, lo and behold, Peter can walk on water. So there he is. He's hovering above the storm, right? And then he looks at Jesus, and he's walking on water. And he looks back at the guys. <laughs> Check it out. But he gets his eyes off Jesus, and he starts looking at the storm. What happens? He sinks. And then the way the Baptist preachers tell the story is, it, it, it is, is that you would almost believe that the way that he got out of that situation is he put his eyes back on Jesus. And then when he put his eyes back on Jesus, he started to levitate out of the water. Is that what it says? He never put his eyes back on Jesus. When he began to sink, you know what Jesus did? Reached in and pulled him out. Him getting his eyes back on Jesus didn't have anything to do with it. God's going to save you from the storm whether or not you keep your eyes on him if you're his. Because he's not going to let you go even if you let him go. Because that's not how he rolls with his kids. And it's not based on performance and it's not based on acceptance. Because God's going to get you and grab you whether or not you put your eyes back on him because there's only so far he will let a storm affect his children, even when they're not living by faith. And if you can't say amen to that, I got nothing for you, brother. If you're a child of God, your Savior controls the forces of nature. He's not in them. Did you see that? He's not in them. But he controls them. He's only in that still small voice of the Holy Spirit when you get alone with Him and you get alone in His Word and He calms the storms that are raging in you and around you with His voice. Behold, what manner of man is this that even the storms obey His voice. So yes, doctrinally, He's a Jew in Petra. And since we're talking about secular music, God gives Him an earth, wind, and fire concert. And he's protecting him from Jezebel and seals and vials and trumpets and the, that Babylonish, whorish religious system in the wilderness. But devotionally, what does that teach us? It teaches that we are spared the wrath of God to come, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 4 through 10, because just as sure as the church can't go through the tribulation period, you cannot go through the unbearable 
forces of nature that are coming to rage against your soul. Because if God can protect a Jew during the tribulation period, and he can protect Elijah during the earth, wind, and fire concert, and he can protect you with whatever it is you're going through, and if he thought you couldn't be taken through it, then he wouldn't take you to it. You know what the Bible says about the tribulation? If it were possible, it would deceive the very elect. You know why it can't deceive the very elect? Because we're not here for it. Because God will not allow us to go through anything that we cannot withstand. And when a deception comes to this planet that is so strong that it would deceive the elect, God takes us out of here so we can't be exposed to it because it would be against his character and nature to let his body, his bride, his church go through a trial and a storm that they can't handle. And if that's true about the tribulation period, it's true about whatever it is that you're saying is an insurmountable task for God to conquer in your life today. You take that to the bank. If you're hidden away in the rock, it won't hurt you. And brothers and sisters, I leave you tonight with something to rejoice over. But here comes the world. Here comes the devil. Here comes the flesh. And it's going to, what? It's going to, and it's going to, and it's going to blow your house in. And all the little Laodicean piggies go, they start squealing and running. They're afraid of the big bad wolf. How'd you get here, brother? <laughs> how you how you afraid? You want to see somebody blow. You want to see somebody shake. You want to see you you want to see somebody huff and puff. You wait till God gets a hold of this planet and He shakes it. And he blows those trumpets and he pours out those vials and he destroys his enemies. You wait. You want to see somebody huff and puff and blow somebody's house in. You wait till Jehovah gets his shot. And that same power to destroy this world system is the same power that he has to protect you from it now. But you've got to believe it. You've got to have faith. If you're saved, there is no way you can lose because you're going to win in the end. And it isn't even based on your own righteousness and performance. And that knowledge should give you the ability to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Look at Psalm chapter 27, verses 13 and 14. I had what? I had fainted. Unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. You're going to walk with the righteous someday in the land of the, lim- of the, land of the living. And the, listen, and those skin worms destroy Mark Trotter's body. Yet in his flesh, he shall see. So I miss Mark. I do too, boy. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. You'll see him again. We act like that's not even true. What happened to us, Church of God? What happened to us? And did college football get that important? Did the stock market get that important? Did 
Did the brand of clothes and the places that your kids vacation make it that important? And did hunting get that important? Did your car get that important? What happened, man? How did you get here, bro? Whose hand are you in? Psalm 43, verses 1 through 5. Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. For thou art the God of my strength. Why dost thou cast me off? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? O send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me unto thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles. Then will I go unto the altar of God, unto God my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O God my God. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. I'm going to close with a weird one. Abram's bartering with God. You know, I'm told Abraham was the first Hebrew. So law first mentioned on their way to Sodom and Gomorrah. He starts Jewing God down. And so they go from 50 to 40, right? And they go from 40 to 30. And then they go from 30 to 20. And then you know where Abraham stops? Do you ever notice this? What number does he stop at? Stops at 10, doesn't he? You know how many people are left in his family back in Sodom? 10. All he cared about was his family. You ever see that thing, brother? Oh, yeah, brother, don't tell me, man. He gets the ten righteous in the city. And does he go down to five? Or does he stop at ten? He goes down to five, doesn't he? Yeah, because there's five righteous in the city, my bad. Hey, you got to forgive me, man. I've been been up for three days in a row. I didn't even know I was going to preach so late. He goes down to five. You got five there. And they start talking back and forth. And he asks God a question. You ready? Shall not the judge of all the earth be righteous? Isn't that the real issue with our depression? Is it right that Mark Trotter should die at 64 years old? Is that right? Well, I don't know. Did God do it? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? We going to question that? You know, it's a funny thing, brothers and sisters, because the more I deal with Laodiceans, Even if they don't say it, it just seems to me like with their actions, that their answer to that question is no. Isn't that half the thing?
that um, that I've learned in the last I don't know four years now is that and I didn't always believe this I didn't always believe that the Bible had the answers for everything I didn't always believe a preacher recently that that I am acquaintances with he made a statement on Facebook that he didn't believe that the Bible had everything that we needed. And I, you know, I started to engage and I thought, eh, this is going to waste more time of mine than it would be if I just walked on. So I walked on and, but I still, I, I thought about that and, and what, that was one of the deals that, 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 that just like, just like Brett, Brother Mark. I don't know how many times you ever heard him here, but man, he really believed that that this book, like you didn't need anything else. Like whatever problem he was dealing with, it didn't need. And look, I'm not here to judge where everybody is. I'm not. I, I'm. I'm telling you where I'm at. That I, I really like was preached tonight. I really do feel because I, I, you, you, uh, I was, the, I was Elijah, <laughs> and um, uh, did really wrong at a church one time, and um and, and just went man i went so far downhill so fast it was to the point to where um i came i was back here and um dealing with some stuff and and i went to the doctor and i got put on uh i don't remember what it was but but i took it for like a month and and jordan finally looked at me and she's like i, I don't know who this dude is right here but I like the guy that was like tripping out really bad, way better than I like the guy that sits around in the recliner all day and never talks to anybody. And he's just very dull and very boring. At least when you're acting like a, you know, raging lunatic, it, it, it gets kind of comical at times. And I'm like, oh, so what, what do you think I need to do? And she's like, I think you need to, Whatever you do, I think you need to pour whatever you're taking because it's really mind-altering at this point in time. And so, there again, I'm not here to judge everybody's situation where they are. I am here, though, to reiterate the point that we don't have any other medicine to offer you. Like, I, I don't have anything else but this. Like, this is all I got. And, 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 and I really do believe it's all I need. Like, this is it. Like, I don't, I, if you're hurt, man, this is it. If you're, if, you're, if you're depressed, this is it. If you're anxious, this is it. If you're scared, this is it. If you live in perpetual fear, man, this is the answer. It, I mean, there, it just goes on and on. And so I, I just want to kind of re-up on that whole thing and say and, and make sure that we all know, like, dude, if we don't ever come to the point, that if we don't ever come to the point where we really do believe that this book has all things that pertains to life and godliness, guess what? Discipleship is never going to work. I don't care how many, I don't care how many years you spend with a person. It'll never work because all it is is a bunch of knowledge. All it is is a bunch of learning Bible verses that nobody really believes. Now it, well, I believe them. Well, we don't live them. So what do we do? We get in here and we learn all this Bible and, you know, what? we go down the road and we're debating the Jehovah's Witness and the Mormon and all this crap. And then next thing you know, we're sitting around in a corner somewhere sucking our thumb when we just got done debating the Jehovah's Witness. It just don't make sense, right? So, you know, a message for such a time as this, 
would be would be this um, is in the day and age in which we live there's not going to be a pile of churches around that's going to say we believe this book and if they do say they believe this book it's going to be this book in the form of like 15 versions and you know us we 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 have found the one that we feel like God has given us, and, and look, man, we're holding to that thing with everything within us. And so, I hope, man, man, if you don't believe it, I hope you go home and you think, did, did God give us something that we can believe? And if he didn't, then he's not really a good God. If he didn't give us something that has all the answers, then he's not really as good as he said he is. So, it's time for them to get out. Let's pray. And um, let's go out and eat. Right, come get these. Let's pray. And, and um, uh, Brother Sean, why don't you pray for us?